Uh, hello, everyone. I want to introduce our speaker, Yvonne Van Ruskensfeld, whose interest in World War I arose out of the historical walking tour she gives in a heritage cemetery, cemetery in Victoria, British Columbia, where many great war veterans are memorialized. She has also given presentations on soldier memorials, World War I military nurses, prisoners of war, the Royal Flying Corps in North America, and the Cycle Corps of the Canadian Expeditionary Force. She is a member of the Western Front Association, Pacific Coast Branch, the Old Cemetery Society of Victoria, and the Victoria Historical Society, and she's convinced me that I need to go up to Victoria to see how beautiful it is and a lot of the World War I things. So Yvonne, on that note, over to you. Okay, thanks very much, Jim. Let me get my screen up here. And uh, let me get that up there. All right, is that, can everybody see that? Yes, we're fine. Okay, terrific. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I really wanted to talk about this because we'd heard um, so much about horses in recent years. Um, you know, uh, with the war horse, um, both the book and the, um, the movie and the stage show, and of course, other things around that um, leading up to the, and during the uh, centenary of the end of the war, <clears throat> pardon me, um, so I got thinking about other animals and I, I thought of, you know, there's got to be lots of things that, <clears throat> excuse me, let me uh, just get a little water here. There must be lots of other aspects that we don't know about. And as you see here, of course, one would be dogs, but I discovered quite a range of uh, animals that were involved. Now, let me just answer. So, of course, the horses, you know, we often think of the horses as carrying men, uh, either just to battle or being used as cavalry. These particular horses are in downtown Victoria, carrying the men of the Canadian Mounted Rifles um, from the military camp, the large military camp that we had here in Victoria. But other animals were used in a wide variety of ways, either as, you know, cogs in the machinery of war, carrying messages, laying wire, that kind of thing, or as other roles, um, just maybe as mascots or just as comfort, uh, you know, showing comfort to, uh, to soldiers uh, in, who are lonely. Now, I got interested in this topic when I was preparing my, um, my talk about the Royal Flying Corps in North America, and I came across this photo of a pilot, fling, or a, probably an observer perhaps, flinging a, um, a pigeon into the air and I thought, wait a minute, a pigeon in an airplane being thrown out of the airplane? I had to know more. Well, I did know, of course, already that pigeons were widely used um, in the, uh, during the war for carrying messages. Um, and uh, it was interesting to discover just how widely they were used. Um, the, um, uh, they were, it was a massive, massive number of them were used. Both the Allied and Central Powers used tens of thousands of homing pigeons to send messages. Uh, you can see here um, around the, the uh, pigeon's leg, uh, the little canisters that were attached, plus every pigeon was tagged um, so that it could be connected to the loft and also uh, where it was being sent from. Um, they, uh, the pigeons were so important, in fact, that in Britain they passed the Defense of the Realm Act, and it was made it made it a crime to quote kill, wound, otherwise molest, or not take adequate care of pigeons. Um, of course, German in, the Germans uh, quickly realized that uh, this the pigeons were a danger. They wa they really wanted to stop, of course, the messages getting through. So, in occupied areas in Belgium and and, uh, and France, they um, they ordered pigeon keepers. And of course, uh, one thing we should keep in mind in those days, a lot of people kept pigeons. Homing pigeons were a popular hobby. Uh, people would, you know, race them and that kind of thing, or just even keep them as pets. 
So a lot of people had pigeons. So the Germans uh, put out an order that all pigeons, domestic pigeons, should be destroyed. Um, and uh, they were fairly effective in this, except for some uh, owners who resisted and some pigeon owners, some farmers especially, were killed because they refused to get rid of their pigeons. Um, the reason that pigeons had such a crucial role, obviously they could fly, but they could fly very fast and they could fly very high. Also, uh, they were um, very silent. They were obviously silent and difficult to intercept because they went so high and so fast. They were little affected by gas or noise, a good thing in a combat zone, and they were trainable to either a fixed home or a mobile loft. Uh, they could fly 30 miles per hour or faster. Um, there was a record of one that flew 22 miles in 22 minutes. So they would relay messages from the front lines either to headquarters or to mobile lofts, which we'll see in a minute. Um, and uh, they were more reliable and more secure than telegraph and radio. They had a very high success rate. And in fact, uh, the Germans, in addition to trying to get rid of the pigeons, actually brought in hawks to attack pigeons uh, at the front lines. Um, the Navy also made use of uh, pigeons uh, in, on ships, um, submarines, military planes. Uh, pigeons uh, were, were kept in case of sinking or crash landing. Now, this slide shows pigeons being loaded into a seaplane. You can see here the pigeons in a basket. And on the right, you see the official letter um, type of paper that was used. These were, of course, tiny little pieces of paper that were used for uh, soldiers put, uh, sent with the pigeons so that men could write the um, messages on there. And you can see at the bottom there that it was very official, the government pigeon service. And you'll notice the little um, message at the bottom. It says to be taken to the nearest postal telegraph office. And that was there because sometimes the pigeons couldn't make it back to their actual home uh, loft uh, because of uh, how far they had to fly or whatever. And whoever found them was supposed to take them in, as it says there. Now, um, there's a great story from uh, Canadian Flight Commander Robert Leckie. DSO, DSC, DFC, of the Royal Naval Air Service, of course, in the First World War, until 19, April 1st, 1918, there were two air services uh, on the Allies side um, and the British side. Uh, one was the Royal Naval Air Service and the other was the Royal Flying Corps. Um, and Flight Commander Leckie was with the Royal Naval Air Service. He was the only airman ever credited with downing two German Zeppelins. But his experience with the pigeons happened when he was returning home from an encounter um, with German uh, hostile aircraft over the North Sea. And he was, um, he came down with his seaplane was riddled with shrapnel. And they were over 50 miles from land. So there was him and his two crew, but nearby was another plane that had engine failure. And so he took, and it, it was sinking. So he took his, those three men into his plane. So there were six men in this one plane and they had four pigeons. So they released one right away as soon as they went down. Waited, nothing happened. Second day, they released another one. Third day, another one. All of those failed to reach a home loft or land at all. And finally, they set the fourth one free in fog. Of course, the pigeon, like the men, was hungry and thirsty had to struggle over 50 miles, of course, no landmarks or anything. It didn't reach its loft, but it did manage to flutter down by a Coast Guard station. The Coast Guard station alerted the authorities and the message was delivered and six airmen were saved. So there's lots of stories like that related to these pigeons and their in, intre, intrepidness. Uh, as for the pigeons lofts, here we have a mobile one. Um, and uh, it shows that uh, they, uh, they could be carried around. It's quite a large number you see there. Um, and they easily found their way back to these lofts. The um, pigeons themselves would be distributed. You can see here um, down in the lower left, this man on the motorcycle with pigeons in, a, in, in the basket. And here's how the pigeons were carried. They were put in little straight jackets so they wouldn't flap around and hurt themselves. Uh, when they were um, 
uh, when they were being transported. Um, here you see also, uh, in this case, Germans carrying uh, the pigeons on their, on their backs. And this is an interesting device here on the one on the far right. And that's a gas proof chamber because although pigeons weren't as sensitive to gas as uh, some other animals who we'll meet later, uh, they still needed to be protected in gas attacks. And so here you see the, uh, the men loading the pigeons into the gas uh, protection chambers and the men themselves wearing the gas masks. Now, um, the, uh, the use of, um, of the actual um, messages could be a really fiddly thing. You, you saw how small those little canisters were on the pigeon's leg. And here you've got two soldiers working on putting a message onto the leg and then releasing the pigeon into the air. Um, this was such a, a fiddly and tedious exercise that one Australian um, wrote a proposal to headquarters suggesting that they breed pigeons with parrots so that soldiers could actually just say the, their messages to the, to the bird and it could repeat it at the other end. Uh, they were, of course, credited, as I say, with saving lives of all the allied forces. Um, there's a couple of good examples at Verdun after a fierce, uh, with a fierce um, poison gas attack and shelling. Um, there was a desperate defense. Uh, this was 1916. Uh, the uh, pigeon managed to carry a vital message from one of the commanders there of the French forces. And his message concluded with the desperate words, this is my last pigeon. But I'm sure um, all of the, uh, many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with a very famous pigeon, Cherami. Now here you see him, and it's a him stuffed and on display at the Smithsonian. Cherami served in the U.S. Army Signal Corps in France with the American sector in Verdun. He delivered 12 messages, um, the last one on October 4th, 1918. Uh, when he was shot through the breast and the leg, you can see there that he uh, lost a leg in that encounter. And uh, despite being gravely in injured by enemy fire, he was able to carry on and save the lives of almost 200 men. This was in the infamous Lost Battalion of the US Army 77th Infantry Division. They were trapped behind en enemy lines and were accidentally being shelled by the Americans. So they sent a message that read, quote, we are along the road parallel 276.4. Our artillery is dropping a barrage directly on us for heaven's sake, stop it. The US Army received the message, redirected its, its artillery fire and found and relieved soldiers, thanks to Cher Ami. The pigeon was uh, rewarded for his bravery and outstanding service by the French. Uh, he got the uh, Croix de Guerre with Palm and he also got um, um, other awards as well. He died June 13th, 1919 from the wounds from delivering his last message. Now, a really odd kind of possible use for pigeons I came across was, as you can see here, aerial photography using pigeons. Now, this was actually a technology that was developed before the war by a gentleman who had homing pigeons and was very curious as to where his pigeons went and what they saw. And so at the outset of the war, um, this, uh, this technology was commandeered by the, um, by the military, and they attempted to use it uh, for surveilling the enemy across enemy lines. However, if you Google pigeon camera photos, you can find lots of Google images of the of photos that were taken mostly before the war. And uh, they're pretty random. I mean, as you can imagine, I mean, the pigeon is swooping and everything. So they really found that they weren't any use for that. And so uh, most of the pigeons were then used for messengers. Um, one thing that they did uh, that was done with pigeons besides having the lofts, um, the pigeons just being used on the side where the allies were, was they would drop them behind enemy lines. And uh, this is because of course, there was lots of people that were against the Germans behind the enemy lines. And so if they dropped uh, baskets of pigeons down there, and of course, as I said earlier, so many people knew how to handle pigeons, they could send messages back to the allies. Um, apparently quite a few of the pigeons arrived safely with valuable information. Um, British pigeons in particular were um, 
um, well looked after. They were, they were sent only on a certain number of miss missions and if they survived, they were retired and uh, cared for very well and given names like Hague and Kitchener. Now the French, of course, valued the pigeons so highly that they actually put up a monument to the pigeons in Lille. And you can see aux pigeons voyageurs. And on the, so you can see the, uh, the, the little pigeon here. I'm not sure why we have snakes. That's a, that's a mystery to me. But on the left, you can see um, the soldiers releasing the pigeons. And on the right, you can see some killed um, and the pigeons flying with their messages. Now, pigeons weren't the only animals that were used as messenger carriers. Of course, uh, we can also think of dogs. Dogs easily and more subtly navigated uh, the rough terrain uh, in along battlefields than men could. Uh, they were highly reliable in the dangerous in this dangerous job. They ran more quickly than a person over rough terrain, and they were less visible and less of a target for enemy snipers. Here on the dog's collar, you see these little canisters. That was where the messages were placed um, for when the dog was being used. Um, here we see, you can see the soldier putting a little message in the canister, obviously uh, much less fiddly than with the pigeons. And uh, down below, you can see a dog with a gas mask um, being prepared uh, to carry messages. Now, um, one particular story of a very brave dog happened in the Battle of Verdun, like the, the ones that I just told you about, the, the pigeons. And these were a group of soldiers, French soldiers who were boxed in and they were ordered to hold on until um, reinforcements arrived. They fought for two days without help. The phone and telegraph lessons left uh, lines were down and they had no pigeons left. So that was, they were in dire straits. They were besieged, low on food, ammunition. And then all of a sudden they saw an amazing sight. They saw what looked like a large winged figure racing towards them as fast as it could, that it almost, it was leaping over the, the, the terrain, almost appeared to be flying. They couldn't tell what it was at first, um, but uh, they, uh, they could see that it wore a gas mask and across its shoulders, it had something that looked like wings. Now, some soldiers, of course, thought of the Angel of Mons. Um, this was uh, a vision that British soldiers, some British old soldiers saw at the beginning of the war when they were retreating from Mons that uh, they felt protected them and saved them from destruction. But there was one French soldier who was in this unit who knew exactly what he was seeing. His name was Duval and he had been a dog handler and had trained messenger dogs. He knew this dog, the dog's name was Satan. He, so he called out to the dog, urging him on. And for the first about mile and a half, the dog was able to pass through bushes and that, and so could hide from, um, from the snipers. But the last part of his, mess, his, his trip was through open fields. So he became a target. He ran the zigzag pattern that he was taught to, when he was taught to carry the messages, but a sharpshooter saw him and uh, uh, hit him, hitting his leg and making him stumble. The second time he was shot, it broke his right foreleg and he crashed to the ground. Duval, the dog handler, jumped up onto the top of the trench, of course, making himself a complete target for the uh, snipers. And he shouted in French, obviously, but I'm not going to attempt French, Satan, have courage, my friend, for France. It was suicidal bravery on Duval's part. And sure enough, he was shot down. But Satan heard his master's voice, stumbled on, with his wounded leg hanging limp and miraculously made it to the French trench and was welcomed, of course, by the uh, arms of the waiting sol sol soldiers. The message that they received from the dog, uh, that the dog carried, said, for God's sake, hold on, we will relieve you tomorrow. Those wings, though, so he had the little message tube, but the wings that were on his back were two little containers, each one holding a pigeon. Imagine how the pigeons felt after that trip. So the besieged soldiers took the two pigeons and wrote messages back saying that they would hold on and beg them to take out the guns, giving the positions of the Germans that were firing on them. And they threw first one pigeon 
and then the other one, both carrying the same messages. One pigeon was shot down, but the other one made it through. So the French were able to take out the German guns and the soldiers were saved. An American reporter who was reporting on this, he wrote, quote, the garrison was able to hold out until re reinforcements came all because one hairy mongrel refused to die while his errand was still uncompleted and because he was too loyal to quit. Now, here's a dog, as you can see. So here's the wings like that Satan had. So that is actually holding a pigeon. And this dog has one on the other side that is also holding a pigeon. So there were approximately 20,000 dogs that worked for the Allies, but they worked in more than just carrying messages. Um, with so many dogs, of course, they had to have a lot of kennels. And here are, this is an example of French kennels. And um, you can see how the, many dogs were just in this one installation. Uh, this picture always reminds me of the little Hobbit village from Lord of the Rings. Now, military dogs fulfilled a, a range of, um, of tasks depending on their size, intelligence, and training. Um, casualty dogs are called mercy dogs were trained to locate the wounded on battlefields. Um, they were equipped with medical supplies in, in little pouches on the side and uh, for soldiers who were able to tend their own injuries or a mercy dog would just stay with a, a wounded soldier until he died. Here you see a German medic with his dog and a British casualty dog. Um, Learning about these dogs solved a mystery for me. Um, I did some work and gave presentations on Canadian military nurses in the First World War. And the last time we went to Ottawa, I was very keen to see the, the monument to the nurses, the memorial to the nurses in our parliament buildings. And when I saw it, I thought, but there's a dog. Why is there a dog in a, in a monument to that it depicted nurses and hospitals and, and medics? Well, now I know it's because dogs were used. Um, in these situations. Now here you see a soldier removing a bandage so you can see how the dogs were used for in those cases. Now sentry dogs of course were also important. Um, they were trained to bark or growl if they detected an unknown or suspect presence in a secure area like a military base or a camp. Um, here we have a dog in training. You obviously this is these are French and obviously this man is British. And he was one of the key dog trainers, which I'll mention in a moment. Scout dogs uh, were trained in a different way. So, so sentry dogs were trained to bark or growl. <clears throat> Excuse me. Scout dogs were, were uh, highly trained and they had to have quiet and disciplined natures. And they were used on foot patrols, as you see here. They had the keen sense of smell and could detect the enemy as much as a kilometer away. They were trained to be silent. Uh, they would stiffen their bodies and their tails would go out sharply um, if they, and their hackles would raise if they saw uh, or dissensed um, enemy presence. <clears throat> Britain actually set up a war dog school and that gentleman that you saw in a previous picture was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edwin Richardson trained 7,000 pets that were donated to the war effort. Other tasks, hauling guns. The Belgians use dogs for, for as animals to haul wagons well before the war, it's a tradition in Belgium, but during the war they used them to haul guns, laying wire, catching rats, of course, look at that Jack Russell there, catching those rats and look at the size of those rats. Many different breeds of dogs were used in a variety of things, of course, that's the small terriers for rat catching, um, for other tasks, Dobermans and German Shepherds were particularly uh, popular, and of course, they were mascots, but I'll talk about that a little later. Now, I can't, uh, of course, uh, other animals, uh, I mean, the dogs used were used on a small scale for hauling things, but really other animals, horses, mules, donkeys were used for most of the major hauling. And I love this touching tribute to uh, one of the horses at a remount depot in the US. The remount depot, depots where, where horses were trained uh, for their use in the battlefields, and also if they were wounded, where they were sent for recovery. And there were remount depots in, of course, the UK and in France um, and in North America. Um, of course, the horses and mules and donkeys uh, were used to haul things where motorized transport just wasn't practical. 
um, which was often the case because uh, we're all familiar with the pictures of the battlefields of, your, of the First World War, the mud, the shell holes and everything. And the, uh, the horses and the mules and that were, were the ones who were used. Um, in fact, uh, the general consensus is that without the millions of horses of mules and donkeys serving on the various uh, fronts, this war of attrition would not have been possible. Even the British army, which was the most mechanized uh, during the bulk of the war, relied on horse and horses and mules for transport. But no, by November 1918, the British army had almost 500,000 horses and mules, which distributed 34,000 tons of meat and 45,000 tons of bread every month to soldiers. Of course, you have to remember these are living creatures, so they had needs as well. And so these same animals carried about 16,000 tons of forage for them each month. Now the horses and, and, and mules and also pulled limbers for artillery, wagons, ambulances, supplies and munitions, and you know, basically anything that was needed, either singularly or in teams. They were the backbone of the logistic support. Most of the mules came from the US, which I found uh, interesting. Of course, losses were high, uh, exhaustion, disease, um, starvation, enemy action. And of course, the, the high casualties from enemy action aren't surprising. Horses, mules, and even donkeys make very large targets. Now, horses have, of course, re as I said right at the beginning, received lots of coverage. So I'm gonna talk about mules and I have to say, after doing preparing for this talk, I was I, I just developed a whole new respect for, for mules. They are crossed between a male donkey and a female horse, 30% stronger than a horse of the same size and less likely to spook. And they're very smart. They have no aptitude for galloping or jumping, so they're not used for cavalry. I have a quote from a British officer, an ex-cavalry officer, when he was first assigned to handle mules. Uh, he felt that he had fallen on off the social ladder. Uh, it was only through working with them that he really developed a respect for them. He said, quote, having had experience of mules, donkeys, and horses, I would always choose a mule. I might not make a showy start, but I should still be going after everyone had stopped. This particular photo is from a postcard, and on the back it says, she is very stupid, but I'm very fond of her. Here we have uh, mules pulling uh, uh, wagons for the, uh, the Newfoundland Regiment. Uh, and uh, the thing about the mules and the donkeys was although they were slower than horses, they could carry far more weight and they were easier to maintain. And they became very popular among allied troops. This comes up again and again about how popular the animals were with the troops. The downside with mules was they, they were noisy. They tended to bray at night, which is not something you want to call it. You don't want to call attention to your position. So often they would have their vocal cords removed. They required less food than horses. Uh, more tolerant of extreme heat and cold and could go for longer periods without water. Um, they were more resistant to diseases. And I have a great example of the cleverness of, of mules that was uh, uh, described by a general daunt, a British general daunt. He observed a group of mules who got tangled up, who got in, uh, caught up in a tangle of barbed wire. Now a horse in that situation would panic and, and uh, hurt itself. But apparently these, these couple of mules, they just stood there and they looked at the, the, um, the wire and they looked at it and they looked around at it. And then gradually they started to pick at it. Pick this, pick that, pick this. And they were able to disentangle themselves and walk away unharmed. Uh, just amazing. Other um, ways that um, mules were used as ambulances, seated as you see here, looks fairly comfortable. The reclining one, not so comfortable, but if that was the only way you were gonna get help, that was the way you would go. Um, of course, they, they would get bogged down and they'd have to be uh, a hauled, um, you know, out. It was a horrible, horrible um, working conditions for anything. Um, and, uh, and they carried tons of uh, ammunition. Uh, what well, three quarters of the ammunition used at Passchendaele was delivered by mules. Donkeys were also used uh, you can see here um, some uh, used on the pulling these wagons and here down below you see donkeys carrying soup and in fact donkeys were used because they were so small they could be used in the trenches to carry food. Uh, the French used them uh, usually it was uh, 
um, soldiers who were too old to serve would handle the donkeys and lead them through the, um, uh, through the trenches. This slide shows two images uh, about uh, a fellow named John Simpson Kirkpatrick, although Kirkpatrick was his, his full name, he was only known as John Simpson. And this was at Gallipoli. He became an Australian war hero with his mule, with his donkey, Murphy. And uh, they uh, saved many, many wounded in, at Gallipoli, where he would go into the hills every single day to save them. Now, another noisy animal, like the donkeys and the mules, that was used was camels. Um, if we were in person, I'd ask how many of you had ridden a camel. Um, but I have actually ridden a camel. And it, I have to tell you, um, it gives me a whole lot of respect for the men who served as cameleers, as the members of the Imperial Camel Corps uh, were known. Of course, camels carried heavy loads. They could go days without water. Um, how they were used was as, uh, these were basically infantry units. So the camels would be used to get someplace because they could travel quite quickly, three miles per hour walking, six miles per hour on foot. And then the soldiers would dismount and fight. They could carry uh, about 320 pounds, which was the average weight of a cameleer and his equipment and supplies. And they could go up to five days without waters, without water. Of course, they were they, they had the uh, reputation they could be stubborn, they could be cantankerous. And even so, the soldiers, like with the mules, developed a real affection uh, for them. The Imperial Camel Corps uh, was re first raised in 1916, and uh, it served in the Middle Eastern and African deserts. Originally, it was Australian troops from the Gallipoli campaign who served, uh, but eventually it was made up of four battalions. Uh, made up of Australians, New Zealanders, and British. They too were used for ambulances called, they are called cacolets. You can see here, they were stretchers, covered stretchers that were put on a special um, saddle on either side of the camel. Down here is the wounded person being treated. And here you see two men already loaded onto the camel. Um, I wonder what it was like when the camel would get up. If you've ever been on a camel, the camel goes down very, you know, is very steep going up and down because it's got very long legs. So it must've been um, quite the, the feeling. And apparently, I mean, it would be a very jolting motion as the camel ambulances would move along. But um, uh, if that was the only way you were going to get to safety and to treatment, I guess you had to put up with it. There is of course a memorial to the camels the camel battalions, um, which also actually played a role in the Arab revolt alongside Lawrence of Arabia. So this memorial is in London, England in the Embankment Gardens and de de is dedicated to the, uh, 200, the men who, uh, 246 men who died, 106 British, 84 Australians and 41 New Zealanders and nine Indians. And they served in a total of 19 different actions. Now we're coming to the end. I'll just briefly mention some other um, animals that you might not think of. The Tunneler's Friends. This memorial is uh, on the Scottish National Memorial. Um, of course, you can see it's not just canaries, but also mice. And of course, tunneling was a major tactic in the First World War, where miners would tunnel underneath the trenches of the enemy, load it with explosives, and blow it up, and many would be killed, and, uh, and uh, much of the um, uh, trench would be destroyed. Both mice and small birds are very sensitive to gas, so the tunnelers would take this into the, because they would worry about poor ventilation and uh, gas in the tunnels. And uh, also canaries were very handy above ground because they were very sensitive to, um, uh, to gas. Two others that you may never have heard of are um, fireflies or glowworms. Now, these, these last two, I'm just not sure about. But anyway, apparently, sometimes soldiers, if there were a lot of fireflies or glowworms around, they could capture them in jars and use them for lighting if they needed to read a letter or a map rather than lighting up a bright, very bright lamp or flashlight. And then we have um, a discovery by Dr. Paul Barsh of the Division of Mollusks of the U.S. National Museum, now the U.S. National, the US National Museum of Natural History, who discovered that slugs you know, slugs like snails without shells, slugs were very sensitive to gas and they would show this by closing their breathing pores and, and shriveling up. And so soldiers supposedly were issued with 
slugs um, who could detect mustard gas in particular and save the soldiers' lives when they could put on their, um, their gas masks. According to one source I read, quote, the slug brigade ended up saving many lives, but that was only one source. And so now we come to the mascots and companions, which of course, I mean, little dogs like the one you see in this official photo at Willow's Camp here in Victoria um, were very popular with the men. But so dogs, of course, but others as well. Cats, especially on ships and in the trenches, were very popular, not just as pets and mascots, but because they would kill rats and um, mice. An amazing number of infantry battalions and regiments have goats as their um, as their mascots, and I still haven't been able to really come across a good reason for that. And other pets, all kinds of weird pets. I mean, look at this this Scott uh, this fox here. He's got a, uh, a leash on, so he's obviously a pet. Any kind of animal would help people. They could really relate to it. The two very famous ones were Jackie the Baboon and Sergeant Stubby. Jackie the Baboon was from South Africa. Albert Marr, the soldier, was South African, and he had Jackie before the war as his pet. Um, he brought him with him when he enlisted, and at first the regiment just ignored Jackie, but Jackie got to be really popular. He would see a senior officer and he would salute and stand at attention. He would light cigarettes for the other soldiers, and he was a really good sentry because of his high level of senses of hearing and smell. Uh, he could detect enemies uh, well before the soldiers could. He actually spent three years in the front lines um, in the trenches of France and Flanders. In 1916, Albert was wounded and uh, Jackie stayed beside him until the stretcher bearers arrived. In 19, both of them, 1918, both of them were injured at Passchendaele. And you can see that uh, poor Jackie lost a, lost a leg, lost a foot, um, um, but he was uh, promoted to corporal and awarded a Medal of Honor. Now, Sergeant Stubby, he was just plain Stubby at the beginning of the war, and he was a terrier mixed puppy adopted by Private Robert Conroy as a mascot for the 102nd Infantry of the 26th Yankee Division. He learned all the calls and drills and salutes. Um, at the beginning, though, he wasn't supposed to go with them, but Con Conroy smuggled Stubby onto the ship, and he won over the commanding officer because he was able to salute. Uh, he was allowed to go to the front lines as their mascot, but he did much more. He served as a, um, as, as a sentry dog, and he could smell gas before the men could. He would run through the uh, camp barking to indicate that there was gas. Uh, he located wounded on the battlefield. Uh, he would lead soldiers to safety from no man's land or bark until uh, medics arrived. Uh, he caught a German spy uh, who was uh, trying to make a map of Allied trenches. And he was promoted to sergeant. By the end of the war, he had served in 17 battles. But in April 1918, he was seriously wounded, um, injured by shrapnel. He was taken to a field hospital for treatment and to a Red Cross hospital for recovery, where he would wander through the wards, um, raising mor morale for all the soldiers. He received a lot of awards and medals, including one from General Pershing. And of course, just a brief mention of Winnie. Harry Colborn was a Canadian soldier um, for, from the Fort Gary Horse, and he was a member of the Canadian Army Vet Corps. He bought Winnie. In those days, you could buy a, uh, a bear uh, when they were going through Northern Ontario. Uh, he named him after his, his um, hometown of Winnipeg, uh, kept him in his tent when he was in training in England, and then placed him at the London Zoo. He'd fin fi uh, visit him when he was back in London on, uh, on leave, and then actually donated him to the zoo after the war. And that is where A.A. A. Milne and his son, Christopher Robin, saw Winnie and became in uh, fell in love with him. And hence, Winnie the Pooh is named after this particular bear. Now, all over the world, there are memorials to animals in war. And I'm going to conclude with the um, inscriptions on the one in London, England, which is a fantastic memorial. On the front, it says, this monument is dedicated to all the animals that served and died alongside British and allied forces in wars and campaigns throughout time. They had no choice. On the back, it says, 
Many and various animals were employed to support British and allied forces in wars and campaigns over the centuries. And as a result, millions died. From the pigeon to the elephant, they all played a vital role in every region of the world in the cause of human freedom. Their contribution must never be forgotten. And that is that. So I am happy to answer questions if I can. Brilliant. Very well done. Excellent program. <laughs> Thank Not you. Really you can, this. Yvonne, if you can. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Stop the share. There we and go. I wanna, as an animal lover, I want to just thank you for that. Uh, very moving. And just in my own research, the lifespan of a pack animal on the Western Front was something like 10 days, not more than two weeks. So yeah. one question has already come up, and that is, can you recommend any books on animals during the war? Um, I can, but sadly, I don't have it in front of me. But um, uh, Jilly Cooper wrote a book about animals in war. She's a British, a British author. And I would highly recommend that. And there's tons of information online. Uh, there's been, uh, because of the centenary of the war, um, lots of um, articles have been written and there's many sources in those as well. Now, I would possibly suggest if you can think of any, you can forward it to Melanie. Yeah. The admin, and then I think she can probably get it out to the, to the folks. Oh yeah, I can do that. I have I have all my sources recorded, so I can I can set, definitely do that. Yvonne, there is one book I would recommend called The Twenty Fifth Hour. Are you familiar with that? No, I don't know that one. Uh, that's about that's about a bird that was kept in submarines. Oh wow! To oh, I love that. Whether the the air in the submarine was dangerous or whatever. Oh, yeah. Was. It's called The Twenty Fifth Hour. I I found it absolutely fascinating because it's the one thing they watched constantly in a submarine was to oh, see yeah. whether the air quality was gonna be dangerously low or whatever it was. But yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's a well-written book, but it's a long time since I read it, since, but it just came back to me is, I don't even remember who the author was. Yeah. But I just wanna say, Yvonne, you gave a brilliant presentation of something <laughs> you don't know anything about and your photos are absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah, there's some great photos out there. Yeah, I bet they are. They really are. You really highlighted my day today, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Sal. The, the photos were wonderful. Just another question. Is you know the first name of the author, Cooper? I believe it's Jill. Okay. But again, I'll, I'll send that. I'll get the complete information publisher and everything and, and send that to, to Melanie. And Phyllis is asking, can you comment on the mayor, Sergeant Reckless? It's Marine in Korea. I'm not sure what that means, but do you know who Sergeant Reckless is? I have no idea. I'm, I'm, and I have to say my, my focus is always on the First World War. I'm not like generally uh, sort of animals in war. Phyllis, if you can unmute yourself, you can maybe expand on your yeah, comment. I'd be very interested. Yeah, I can give you a little bit of background. Uh, she had uh, she was undersized and she had originally been bred to be a racehorse and then the war started and I don't remember how she got into the Marines but she ended up hauling uh, ammunition and supplies to the troops and once she learned what uh, trail to travel to get to where she she needed to be that's what she did she uh, really didn't know she was a horse. I think she thought she was a person. <laughs> she she lived, uh, the, the guys kept her in a tent. They fed her the same. Long story short, uh, they brought her home after the war. She stayed in Pendleton uh, down in San Diego. She raised a couple of foals and she has a statue and there's several books out about her. Wow, that's great. I have to admit that I did not do much on horses because there've been so much on horses. That's why I really wanted to focus on the others. So I didn't, I didn't take full advantage of all the information on horses, but that sounds terrific. I'll look for that. So anybody else, I think that takes care of the chat questions. If anybody else has a question, unmute yourself and fire away. Um, I'd like to add something about uh, reinventing the wheel. The uh, US intelligence community tried to use balloons with cameras, reminiscent of the pigeons with cameras. 
<laughs> and uh, released them behind the Iron Curtain. And if they recovered it, they'd get a nice picture of uh, maybe a wheat field or a forest. So un unless you had some landmark that you could positively identify a location, it was absolutely worthless. Yeah, yeah. But again, we had to reinvent the wheel to find that out. <laughs> Yeah. One thing I would say about the, the pigeon camera photos, um, like I say, you can just just put go to Google Images and Google it. They're actually quite artistic because they got this kind of you know wonkiness to them, so they look they look like uh, something you know that you might see in an art gallery, but uh, not very helpful in terms of military surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions, comments? I have a question. If I can throw this in, uh, Yvonne. How early did they apply all these animals in the, the war? Was it sort of from the very beginning or was it sort of um, by uh, discovery or was it? Right from the beginning. In fact, uh, you know, because like things like pigeons had been used for oh, thousands of years as, as um, messengers and uh, that kind of thing. So they knew about the pigeons, the dogs. Um, that they, they did have a bit of a problem with the dogs sometimes because the, the soldiers didn't like to put the dogs at risk, you know, to send them as messengers and things like that. Um, so it built up through the war to the use of dogs. But of course, horses and that they right away, I mean, the British started commandeering horses from people, you know, that you see that in War Horse. Um, the mules, um, that must have, I, I think the mules must have come a little later because Britain didn't have a lot of mules. They had to get them from the United States. So that, uh, that came a little later um, when they discovered, when they found out how good mules were compared to horses for all of these uses. Um, of course, they had used donkeys in the Middle East and, and uh, other places a lot, and those continued to be used. Um, but, uh, but a lot of the uses were, were ones that had been you know, made use of before in the past, um, but then they refined it. And, um, and like the, the training school for the dogs, you know, where they trained them to do zigzag pattern going across no man's land and stuff that built up as they knew what the war was going to be like, um, where they needed the different uh, services. What about happened at the end of the war to all these animals? Oh, I don't think you want to know. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, a lot of them, like the things, um, uh, a lot of them were killed they couldn't do anything they couldn't like it's you know especially like bringing them home and that there's a I, for horses there was a big a lot of difficulty around that you know because there was too many horses to take back to various places and but horse meat was very popular in europe so you know some were were killed for that um dogs and that i suspect a lot of those went home with soldiers you know as as uh, as pets um the pigeons pigeons were eaten as food um uh, you know pigeons are still eaten as food uh, so, uh, you know, uh, they were disposed of if they couldn't be used. All right. Well, thanks for that. So yeah, really sorry ending. about that. that. That's the unhappy <laughs> so, ending to the story. Unless there are any other comments. Yeah, one question. When, Yvonne, what about the world carrier pigeon population now? Where, did the carrier pigeon pretty much go extinct after World War I or has it come back at all? Those, those are two, there's two different, two different things. There's carrier pigeons, which mm -hmm. are, were already almost extinct already, I think, by the time the war started, and homing pigeons. Homing okay. pigeons were the ones that were used in, in, the, um, in the war, not carrier pigeons, although you'll see mm -hmm. people, some articles call them carrier pigeons, but they weren't. They were homing pigeons. And those continue to, uh, people like, especially like in England and that, uh, in Europe, homing pigeons are really popular as a, as a um, um, hobby. There's okay. international races and that kind of thing. But yeah, the carrier pigeons are long extinct. Oh, okay. Thank you. So any I'd other like comments? That, yes, uh, carrier, the holding pigeons. Uh, in the late 40s, when I was in the Boy Scouts, late 40s, early 50s, down in the San Joaquin Valley, we used to release uh, the, the homing pigeons for the races. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So unless there are any other comments, Sal, do you have any final statements? No, just call me, please email me. If you want to give a talk on your specialty, please let me know. A-C, A-S-A-P. All right. And that would be June 11th. June 11th, right. And that would be it. Yvonne, I want to thank you so much. It was enlightening, inspiring, and fun. So, oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, it was fun so, for me, too. So on that note, 
um, I'm going to shut down and we will see everybody next month. Thank you for attending. Thank you.